Good. Um, we're making headway. But I do. And uh, we, we, Cello's Kitchen is right out here to the left. They're wonderful, Justin and myself. And, and Scott had a wonderful fellowship with them. They were so excited to know, uh, being from Uruguay, that we were doing uh, Dia de los Tres Reyes, or Dia de los Tres Reyes Magos, um, celebrating the three kings. But before we do that, something we forgot last week, I, it's my fault, I meant to give it to Scott and Steve. One of the ways we're having fun this Christmas is we're gonna put to rest the greatest Christmas movie of all time. I've been here 18 years, I've been harassed, um, and I figure we'll just settle it, right? At Garfield Church, we'll settle it. So uh, we, we voted last week. Um, those were the results. Uh, Elf made it first, Frosty made it second. But we've got 16 movies that we're voting on each week. We're gonna have the select six go to Christmas Eve. We're gonna vote on Christmas Eve, we're gonna figure it out. If Die Hard makes the first sweet 16, somebody on the staff is getting fired. I'm just letting you know. Okay, so this week, here we are. Take your phone out. You can just go on that Q code, okay? Take, put yourself up on that Q code, or you can put in the little uh, menti.com uh, number. So I'm going to hit that right now. Hit my Q code. Get up there. Okay, so what are this week's selections? Um, come in, come in, come over there. Hit next. So it's a wonderful life, home alone, Polar Express, Christmas vacation, the Santa Claus or any version of Christmas Carol or Scrooge? Gosh, that's a tough one. I'm old, I'm going, it's a wonderful life. Okay, so anything I pick is the right answer. Um, so that should be it. We'll see how we do. I told Terry, Pastor Terry, maybe send us the results at the end of the sermon. We put these in the e-note also on Monday, so till five o'clock Monday, polls are open. That's how you do it. Sunday morning right there, you guys have already done it. Um, or you can do it on the e-note, and we're gonna settle this thing. Okay. Dia de los Tres Reyes, we hope you've gotten booklets, all of you have. I know our, our ushers are passing them out as you came in if you didn't get them last week. We hope you'll take one for family. We spent a lot of time with this. Um, I noticed last year that some of our Puerto Rican leaders at our Pepper Pike campus were putting a lot of stuff up on Three Kings Day on Facebook. I had never really heard of it. And so I began to inquire, um, you know, with Cello and Javier from Uruguay and others of our Hispanic and Latin community, and found out that this celebration is a major part in much of the Latin world around Christmas. It's always on January 6th. I thought, what a wonderful way to redeem that day this year. Um, it's always on January 6th, and it's a celebration of the time that the kings came to uh, pay homage to Jesus. We'll talk about that on Christmas Eve. It didn't happen on Christmas Eve, right? Um, it happened later, much later. There's some talk about that. So we've got in this booklet, I know Scott talked about last week, but things you can do, right? Um, we've talked about, we've got a big history from El Museo del Barrio in New York City. That's the, um, one of the largest Hispanic museums in the country. And New York City has the largest Three Kings Day parade and celebration in America. Um, We've, we've said to, if you set your nativity set out, um, you can use it as a teaching tool. People that celebrate Three Kings Day, they don't add the baby Jesus to the nativity scene until Christmas Eve, and they don't add the Three Kings until January 6th. So I know we were raised, they all showed up all at once. That's what I thought as a child. Um, but I'm using my little nativity tool because we entertain all my family on Christmas. We've got some wonderful recipes in here. We don't have Uruguayan recipes, but we do have Puerto Rican recipes from uh, Mama Pumajero, who was on our video last week. I actually, I'm cooking pernil. You'll be so proud of me, Jessica. I'm, per, I'm, I'm cooking pernil for all my family on Christmas Eve. I tested a two and a half pound roast. My wife said I didn't flunk it, so I'm doing an eight pound. There's uh, all kinds of recipes in here. Um, there's a wonderful uh, coconut eggnog. What you put in that is none of my business, but it's in there. Um, we, we've also said, wait until January 7th to take down your Christmas tree or your lights. People that celebrate Three Kings Day never take down their Christmas decoration or lights until after Three Kings Day on January 6th. Now, if you're like me and your lights stay up on your house until April, you have no worries. But if you're the Martha Stewart type that like on Jan December 27th, you take, don't do it this year. Keep your lights on through January 7th. And then we've asked you to follow the example of the Three Kings. This is spoiler alert for my Christmas Eve message. But the three kings did two things I think was very important. First, they looked up. If they never looked up, they wouldn't see the star. There's a lot to look down on right now. You know, school shootings and division, all other kind of things. There's so much to look down on. And we need to, as Christians, we don't run away from that. We run to it. 
with the love and the grace and the peace and the hope of Jesus Christ. But don't miss the opportunity and the busyness of the world to look up. If they never looked up, they'd have missed a star. So worshiping each week like we're doing here is important. And then we have our, our major uh, Christmas offering. I know some people say, well, all the church wants is my money. No, we don't. That's We want you. God doesn't care about your money. God cares about you. But he challenges us, how are we investing in the work of the kingdom? This has been a heck of a two years for the church in America. I do a ton of coaching nationally with churches, with pastors. And I got to tell you, um, I, several of the churches I co co coach didn't make it through the last two years and closed. There's a lot of churches that have been closing. 25% of pastors in America, if Barna's right, have left ministry in the last two years. So it's been tough, but you guys have been supportive. Of Garfield, we've not run to crisis. Last year was amazing. We've been able to widen the circle, do amazing things like last night. Um, this place was full. We had our you know, diverse, every tongue, tribe, and nation, a chancel choir, orchestra. Um, we raised another $6,500 for Afghan refugees. That means $17,000 members of Garfield Memorial Church has given in the last 11 days. In the last 11 days, over and above their tithes and giving to the church. That means for $1,500, we house an Afghan refugee family. We have housed now a prepared housing for over 17 families. Think about that. And why I think that's so amazing, this is in a season where we remember that our Lord and Savior was born homeless and became a refugee. Bethlehem was not his home, right? He had a 14-year-old pregnant mother and a 16-year-old dad who had to take a nine-day journey down from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And he was born in a, in a place where he had no home, no room for him in a parking garage, and immediately became a political refugee to Egypt. And I think it's so powerful that we have this treasured privilege and opportunity to receive brothers and sisters in the family of God here in Cleveland. We found out last night Cleveland is one of the six destination cities for Afghan refugees. So we're asking you to consider uh, our goal to frankincense and myrrh. You've probably all received this in paper and email, but consider a second mile gift to the church. We take in 30% of, um, of our operating budget in December. And so uh, thank you for helping us to stay strong. We have a lot of stuff in there for kids. We're, there's so much for our kids in, in Dia de los Tres Reyes. Um, we, we learned as in Uruguay, they put out shoes. In Puerto Rico, they put out shoe boxes. So we've asked our families at Pepper Pike and here, maybe practice this with your kids this year. You put out the shoe box, you put in the grass for the camels or oats are permitted in Cleveland since you can't find a lot of grass in January. Maybe this year you can, praise the Lord. Um, but you know, and leave that by the bedside, you leave water for the kings and in the morning, uh, the kings come, the, the camels spread the grass everywhere. There's candy in the box and there's three gifts left. Um, so we're, we're participating in that. Don't miss the day after Christmas. You're not going to want to miss this. December 26th, I know you're like, oh, you know. Look, I normally take that off after preaching five times on December 24th. Not taking off this year because we're going to come in. We're focusing on our kids. We're telling the whole Christmas story. Pastor Scott here, me over at Pepper Pike, wear your pajamas. I'm wearing mine. It'll be cool. And, and the, we hear rumor the three kings are coming to our church both campuses, and there's going to be live camels. Like, how cool is that? Where can you get a Christmas picture with a live camel? Except at South Euclid or Pepper Pike campus. So that's it. Don't miss it. So we're in this, um, we're in this teaching series about the Dia de los Tres Reyes, and we are looking at all the kings that got it wrong. And then on Christmas Eve, these three magi, these three kings, probably more than three, spoiler alert, but they got it right in worshiping the King of Kings. Last week, Pastor Steve and I both talked about Her uh, King Saul. Today, I want to talk about Herod. Herod was the king of Judea, the king, the king of the Jews, lived in Jerusalem. He ruled from 37 to 4 BC. He uh, was actually a puppet king of Rome. He was appointed in 40 BC, but there was already a dynasty in place. It took him three years to conquer that. Um, but Herod was known as Herod the Great, that's how he named himself. If you ever go on a tour with Terry and I to Israel, we've had several groups from Garfield go, the guides over there call him Herod the Crazy, and you'll figure out why if you listen into this message. Do you know that in the Bible there's two Christmas stories? Now there's only one story of the birth of Christ, but two, Luke and Matthew, they tell the story 
very differently. Luke is probably the most familiar story. As I said, Joseph and Mary um, are from Nazareth. The emperor puts out a decree for a tax census. They take a nine-day journey down to Bethlehem, and that's where Jesus is born. The angels appear to the shepherds and say, um, fear not, God is with you. Unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. Um, and they, they go up into the heavens singing, uh, glory to God on high, uh, peace on earth, goodwill to all people. That's Luke's story, and we're familiar with it. Matthew's story is darker. It's different. There's, there's no angel, well, there's an angel that appears to a dream, but there's no, there, there's no singing, um, there's, not, there's not angels singing in the heavens, there's mothers and fathers weeping in Bethlehem. There's, it's a darker story. They, Matthew doesn't talk about the nine-day journey from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. He talks about a, a fleeing from, from Bethlehem and the Holy Family becoming political refugees, which would have been a 30-day journey, 250 miles through the desert. And if you go with us to Israel, the Judean desert is desert. 250 miles. I looked at it on Google Earth, what they traveled. I don't know how they survived. 30 days. Now, we always have Mary on a, on a donkey. That's because we sanitize it. There's no donkey in the Bible, right? They were walking and ended up just outside of Cairo, Egypt. Um, and if it's, instead of the angels, as I said, we've got a verse though up there on the screen. This is what it said. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping, great mourning, no peace on earth, good will to men. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to comfort it because there are no more. Now, this is part of the Christmas story, right? But you don't get any Christmas carols about this, do you? Herod never appears on a Christmas card or in a nativity set. If, if this story, which is a Christmas story, was on a Christmas card, it'd probably look like this. This is a painting by Giotto of the, of the murder of the innocents. Now, how would you like to get that in the mail? Soldiers pulling babies away from their moms, dead infants piled up. But, but Matthew says to us, this is part of the story. And Herod is the key component of the story. He's the antagonist, but he's the key vessel that makes this story happen. Everything that happens in this story is about Herod. He causes the flight to Egypt. He causes the murder of the innocents. He, uh, even when Joseph and the family return, as you heard read, they heard that Herod's son, Archelaus, was in uh, Galilee, was in, they wanted, actually in Judea, that's where they wanted to go. And Archelaus, if you study history, he was as bad as his dad and did all the policies. So smartly, Joseph and the family went north. Herod is driving this story. He's the king that got it wrong. Who is Herod? Herod, first off, let me tell you, he's an insecure, paranoid megalomaniac. That's who he is. He's a puppet king, as I said. Um, he had delusions. He had a thirst for power, right? One of the four truths of the universe per Charles Beard, the greatest uh, historian at Yale toward the end of his life. They asked him, what have you learned in history? He said four things. Number two was the mills of time grind slowly, but they grind exceedingly fine. Three, the bee always robs the flower that it pollinates. Four, my favorite, at Christmas time, only when it's darkest do the stars come out. But his number one one was, whoever the gods seek to corrupt, they first make mad with power. And, and Herod was mad with power. He wanted to be the messianic king. He told people he was a messianic king. He said, I am the one that's greater than David. I am the one that is to come. But the problem was, Herod was Idumean, meaning he was an Edomite, meaning the Edomites came up from the tribe of Esau. And the people said, you're not even Jewish. How can you be a messianic king? Like, you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's where David came from. Not the God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. And so Herod was always trying to be uh, anointed. He was trying to get, um, get attention. He wanted to get affirmation. He was the great king. So what he did is he became a great builder. He built all these buildings. He put his name on it all over Israel. Okay, he rebuilt the temple, which he thought he would find favor to the people. But remember last week where it said Saul was erecting monuments to himself? Herod built all these palaces all over Israel. We've, my wife and I have visited them. It's amazing. Here's the first one. That's, a, that's Herod's palace at Caesarea Maritima. 
It's beautiful. It's on the Mediterranean Sea. That's a rendition. This was his palace. You look through the windows, you see the sea. He built an Olympic-sized pool. Um, if you go to Israel, this is what they'll look like on the next slide. That's where the palace would be. And then the next slide, that's his uh, remnant of his swimming pool. He also built Masada. If you ever heard of Masada, we have that in the next slide. Masada is this uh, huge, huge mountain, thousands and thousands of feet above the Dead Sea. This was Herod's escape plan. He knew people didn't like him, and he figured out he had to have this place in Masada that he could always flee to. And so he built this, and that's the top of Masada, and we've been up there. And actually, he had three, uh, or he had an Olympic sized swimming pool up there. This is a man who built an Olympic sized swimming pool in the desert on top of a mountain. And this is the next slide we have here. This is what's called the Herodian. This is just outside of. Uh, Bethlehem. Herod built this. It was a mountain on a mountain, a man-made mountain. He wanted it to be the tallest structure in the land. Um, so it was taller, actually, than the uh, Pyramid of Gaza. Uh, it was 350 feet in the air, so it was the tallest tower at that time in the land. And it's towering over what? Bethlehem, over the city of David. Do you hear Herod saying, do you see how big I am? And next slide, we have, in, in this particular one, he built three Olympic-sized swimming pools and two theaters, and a concert hall. Do you understand who this person is? Now, some people say this story is not recorded in history. I'm probably going to go a little long, guys, but the Browns don't play to one. Um, anyhow, in history doesn't record the murder of the innocents. That's what it's called. And so some people say, well, this probably isn't true. It's not recorded outside the Bible. Most of the things in the Bible are recorded um, outside the Bible. But let me tell you who Herod was, and then you can understand, I think, maybe why this wasn't recorded in history. Herod, when it took, I told you, it took him three years to attain um, the kingship of Judea. Once he became the king of Judea, he had everyone from the previous dynasty killed, from the Hasmonean dynasty. And that number was in the thousands. In the thousands, okay? Um, and if one time, um, uh, the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish uh, Supreme Court of that day and age, of the priests and the elders of the church, he had half of them killed because they disagreed with him. In a fit of rage at a party at the palace in Jerusalem, he got so upset he had 300 of the guests executed on the spot. He was married three times, had several of his wives killed. He may have had all of them. Um, his second wife was Mary Omni. She was a descendant of the Maccabees, which our Jewish brothers and sisters just celebrated Hanukkah, which is in honor of what the Maccabees did. She was in that precious lineage. He loved Mary Omni, didn't trust her grandfather, had him killed, had her uncle killed, and then thought Mary Omni was cheating on him, so he had her killed, even though he loved her and grieved it all of his life. Of him and Mary Omni's children, his eldest son he got suspicious of because he thought he wanted the throne, so he had him killed. Uh, soon the second in line, that was his son, he had him killed. And then the third one, he had him killed. So that Augustus Caesar in Rome, who knew Herod, he said this, and this is recorded in history. He said, it's safer to be a pig in Herod's house than one of his own sons. When he lay dying in Jerusalem, he would die at 70, about a year after Christ was born. When he lay dying, he ordered his troops to gather 50 to 100, history's not too sure, of the most revered people in all of Jerusalem. And he said, they were under guard in a building. He said, when I die, execute them all so I can guarantee there will be mourning on the day of my death. Now, luckily, they did not obey that order after he died. Now do you understand that the murder, now in the medieval times they said there were 5,000 infants murdered. That's ridiculous. That was an exaggeration. Don't trust the preachers like me. Scholars say there were about 300 people in Jerusalem. So maybe at most, it's, it's horrible, but two dozen male children under the age of two. Do you realize that wouldn't even make a footnote in what this man did? No wonder it's not recorded in history. But it is absolutely consistent with who this person was. Now, who does stuff like this? Who does stuff like this? Why do you do this stuff like this? What leads to us to act this way? Fear and insecurity, right? Have you ever noticed that the bullies in the room are usually the most scared? That's why whenever they're the most insecure, that's why whenever they're stood up to, they, they just melt like water. I was in a shopping mall several years ago, and I was walking back out to my car through Dillard's, through department store, and I noticed a commotion 
And I, I looked over there, and there was this woman that was very agitated. It was, it was almost like December 22nd, and she had brought in a Black Friday coupon that had expired two weeks ago for 20% off. And the, the clerk was trying to be very nice to say, ma'am, this is expired. This woman flew into a rage. She began to belittle this clerk. She talked about her physically. She said, your family must be no good. And I was like, lady, what is 20% worth? Like to crush another human being to get 20% off a blouse? And I was going to go over to say something, but she had walked away. So I went to the clerk, and she was visibly shaken. I said, hey, I'm a pastor. I want you to know that was more about her than it was about you. And with tears in her eyes, she said, would you pray for me? See, why do we do this? See, fear is actually, God gave us fear. There's a fear mechanism that's a good thing. It's called fight or flight, right? I'm a, I'm a crazy fisherman. I'm an outdoorsman. I was up in northern Saskatchewan. I heard some track walking, heavy walking, and I knew I had a grizzly bear tracking me, and my fear mechanism went off. And I got out of there. I got up to Hell's River. What's a preacher doing fishing in the Hell's River in Saskatchewan? I don't know. Um, but I ended up in a boat, and I got out of there before the grizzly stuck his head out. Now, if I didn't have a fear mechanism, I thought maybe I'd have thought it was a petting zoo, and I'd have gotten eaten. So fear mechanism is good, but the problem is when the fear mechanism contracts with our sin mechanism, now it doesn't just save us. It begins to hurt others, right? You don't believe me. Believe Yoda. Scott's going to be so proud I used the Star Wars that reference. Remember Yoda? That, 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 who, was the, who was the Herod in Star Wars? It was Darth Vader. But before he became Darth Vader, he was Anakin Skywalker. And if you read the whole thing, he was actually a young kid and he had the force with him. But he became corrupt with power. But Yoda was worried about this young one. And he said to him, fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. I sense much fear in you, Herod. See, fear and insecurities always do this to us. Here's Herod, the big bully, executing thousands, and now he's terrified by a baby. Do you understand irrational fear? See, this is what happens. Fear leads us to do crazy, crazy things. Gossip, what is gossip? Gossip's fear, it's insecurity. We want to know we're better than somebody else, so we belittle people. It's because we're afraid, right? Those, you know, little clowns were marching in Charlottesville back in 2017. You know, you will not replace us. I have a kid from my youth group. She's a professor at the University of Virginia. When they went up there on the hill, they threw uh, torch fluid on her and threatened to put her on fire and saying, you will not replace us. And if you knew Rebecca, this kid, she's probably 40 now. We had her as a teenager in our youth group. She said, I'm not trying to replace you, a-hole. I'm trying to teach your kids. Why do people act like that? Why don't note replace? Because they're so insecure. Because they're so afraid, right? I read a story years ago, it broke my heart. An 18-year-old, I think it was back in 2011, was sentenced to 21 years in Ventura County, California, um, because of something he had done at 14. Uh, 18, sentenced to 21 years, because at 14, he was at uh, EO uh, Element, or Junior High School in Ventura County, and one of his classmates came out as openly gay. And, and he was very vivacious, and he was very, and, and this kid didn't like it. And one day, the kid was being friendly and being vivacious, talking to him, but he thought he was flirting with him. And he was worried, everybody's going to think I'm gay. So what he did, he brought a gun in the next day in computer class. He shot his gay classmate in the head twice. What, what, what happened? Insecurity. Fear. What will people think? And this thing gets crazy. It gets out on the national level, right? I grew up in the Cold War. We were all afraid of the Soviet Union, right? And justifiably so, and there's nothing wrong with that. But see, when fear gets irrational, how many nuclear warheads do we need to make sure the Soviet Union didn't get us? You know what we decided? 70,000. You know what scholars said? We had enough nuclear power to uh, destroy every inch of the square inch of the Soviet Union and kill every resident of it 30 times over. You know what that cost us in today's dollars? $8.1 trillion. So I know we're debating over trillions of dollars right now, but understand we have legacy debt over fear, irrational fear. And immigration, we know we need immigration laws. We know we understand that, but they're all murderers. They're all rapists. They're going to take our jobs. Everybody in this room knows that's not true. But we cave into fear, right? I mean, in this situation with guns. I'm a, I'm a hunter. I believe in the Second Amendment. I'm a fisherman, right? But the fact that we have more guns in America than we have people, 
right? Like, like in, their, in military style weapons, like are the deer wearing body armor all of a sudden? Like you have a right to defend your home. Everybody says, I need a firearm. Have a firearm. I think that's great. But you need a machine gun? Like is there a marauding army coming to visit you? How do we get here? Fear. Insecurity. And how do we get out of here? That's the key. Let's go back to Yoda. He was talking to uh, Anakin Skywalker's son, Luke Skywalker, right? On the next slide. And uh, you see Yoda there with Luke. And he says, name must be your fear before banish it you can. So here's what I want you to do this week. Go ahead in the next slide. I want you to really spend some time. Do this. Ask yourself these questions. Where are your insecurities? What are your fears? How do you act on them? See, Christmas comes to create this kind of disruption within ourselves to do some introspection. I'm going to say more about this on Christmas Eve, but the fact that uh, Matthew is highlighting Herod and his violent kingdom and Jesus as the Prince of Peace is basically saying, which kingdom will you follow? Which king will you follow? Which, which part do you want to be aligned on? And how do we become people who don't allow our fear to overwhelm us? All right, I'm going to take about, I got four minutes on the clock. I'm going to probably take about 14. So give me that today. Sorry about that. Justin gave me permission. I'm lying. Um, I was afraid and I lied. See how that works? Insecure. What will you think? Blame Justin. See? I'm just a walking parable of how this stuff happens. So honestly, Paul says everything in the universe can be reduced to faith, hope, and love. He said that in 1 Corinthians 13. It's not, the love chapter has nothing to do with weddings. We read at weddings, which is fine, but Paul was saying this is how we love our neighbors. This is how we love one another. And he said, in the end, right, faith, hope, and love abide these three. So how do we not let our, our fears overwhelm us? We put those into application. We have a faith to accompany our fears, a hope to steady us in the midst of our fears, and a love to conquer our fears. Let me be quick. First, a faith to accompany our fears. I love Psalm 34, 4, which says, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. When the disciples got afraid, like in the boat where they thought they were going to drown in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and Jesus is asleep in the boat, frightened, and here's Jesus, frightened, and here's Jesus. Wake Jesus up. Don't you care? We're going to die. Jesus gets up, calms the storm, and he says something to them. He said, where's your faith? Now, that sounds condescending, doesn't it? Like, you know, it's like, like mean old church people. Oh, just have faith. But Jesus is never condescending. This isn't what he's doing. He's basically saying, where is what you believe? Where is these things I've been teaching you? How is that coming into your operating system? How is it working out? My grandma used to say, faith is putting legs up what, under what you believe. Faith is a verb, not a noun. We don't have faith, we faith. That's what the Bible says. We walk by faith and not by sight right? The faith is the uh, uh, substance. It's a confidence of the things we hope for. It's the assurance of what we believe. That's Hebrews 12.1. And so we, we need to apply faith. Jesus said, if you put faith and fear in the same room, they're not going to stay together very long. Martin Luther King Jr. said, fear knocked at the door. Faith answered. There was no one there. So put faith to accompany our fears. Secondly, a hope to steady us in the midst of our fears, right? I love this verse from Hebrew. We have this hope, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters the inner shrine behind the curtain that was behind the veil of the temple, the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, where only on the holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur, could the holiest man in the land, the high priest, go behind the curtain and they tied a rope around him because they were afraid he was going to die so they could pull out his dead body, but Jesus went behind the curtain for us and tore the veil of the curtain and said, you don't have to be afraid. And that's our hope. And so we need to put that hope into action, right? Uh, you know, understanding this. In the catacombs, I had a professor of archaeology in seminary who did a lot of time in Rome, and he spent all this time excavating in the catacombs. That's where all the Christians who were persecuted, fed to the lions, right? Killed by the gladiators. Molten iron poured on them, singing hymns while they were dying. And they're buried in the catacombs in Rome. And he said there's symbols on the graves to prove, show they're Christians. He said there's a cross. There's a fish. He said, but you know the most, like seven to one, the most common symbol in a Christian grave? It's an anchor. We have this hope. 
a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. One of my favorite hymns, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus and his blood and righteousness. In every high and stormy gale, watch this, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Herod wasn't anchored to that. He was anchored to this world. In fact, Masada, his great, uh, his great fortress, you know what Masada means? Strong foundation and support. He put his hope in Masada, and Masada fell. But those Christians put their hope in the Lord and stand in glory even now. Finally, last one, I'm getting, I'm doing pretty good, I'm wrapping up. The last one is we have a love to conquer our fear. Here's what John said. He said, there's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. The one who feared is not perfect in love. You know how I deal with this? When I start to find myself afraid, and even afraid of people, I started saying this prayer, Lord, help me love the people I'm afraid of. You know where I learned that? It was after 911. After 911, if you remember, everything shut down, all the air travel shut down. The day it opened back up, and Terry knows this, I had to fly out to Austin, Texas. I, I was preaching for my, one of my mentors for four straight weeks. He was going through Parkinson's surgery, and I was scheduled to go. I flew the first day you could fly after 911. I went on the plane to sit down, and sitting next to me was a Middle Eastern man my age. And he wasn't in a suit and tie. He had kind of traditional garb. And he looked just like all the people I saw on TV that had taken down the towers. And all of a sudden, I just started, my heart started to palpitate, and I said, should I be looking if he tries to light his shoe or grab him if he gets a box cutter? And, and I just was, all of a sudden, I was so ashamed of myself. And I said that prayer for the very first time. I said, Lord, would you help me love this man? And so we struck up a conversation, and we had the best ride to Chicago Hair Airport, and we talked. We didn't talk about 911. We didn't talk about Islam or Christianity. We talked about our wives. We talked about our kids. We showed pictures. Uh, we talked about what, what we enjoyed doing um, and th things that brought us joy. And, uh, you know, why don't you try that sometime? Lord, help me. Have you ever seen Remember the Titans? Come on, that's a great movie. True movie. Great movie. Remember the Titans? White, all white high school. True story. All black high school came together uh, to create this football team. Denzel Washington, the coach. You remember the story. And there was Gary Bertier, all American linebacker from the all white high school. Julius Campbell, all American defensive end from the all black high school. Hate each other, fighting each other all the time, and eventually become incredible friends. And Gary Bertier in that movie. Um, is in a terrible car accident, and he's laying in the hospital. He only wants to see one person. He wants to see his friend, Julius Campbell. And Julius goes in there, and in this scene that brings, still brings me to tears, he said to, Gary Bertur looks up, and he says, Julius, I was afraid of you. You hear that? I was afraid of you. But I realized I was only hating my brother. When perfect love comes in, it casts out fear. Jesus is calling us to this, friends. He's calling us to this. You know, I heard Russell Moore one time say, we've, we've done it all wrong in the church. We tell people in the church, invite Jesus into your life. He said, Jesus doesn't want to come into your life. Your life is a wreck. He wants to bring you into his life. He wants to bring you into his kingdom. He wants to bring you into his glory. He wants to do it so much that he came here on earth to get you. I'm done in four minutes, Justin. I got one last story. So if you guys want to come up. And Matthew's name for Jesus wasn't his Hebrew name. Do you remember it? He said, you shall call him Emmanuel. Jess sang that second song. Van sang that. Did you hear it? What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. See, I love when Yoda's up on Luke's back <laughs> teaching him, right? It's a, such a great image of the Spirit of God, of Jesus the Christ come into our condition to say, I'm bringing you faith and hope and love. I'm giving you an ability to fight back against your fear so you don't go down the dark side, so you don't stay so insecure that you end up hating your brother and your sister. Or worse! And Jesus came to do that. That's Emmanuel. Let me close with this story. I'm going to read it to you. I just came across it. It's from a professor at the University of Akron just down the street. Her name is Audrey Sandstrom. Audrey wrote an article that was posted recently, which really caught my attention. And her article from a professor of writing at the University of Akron was this, one phone call that changed an addict's life. And here's what she said. I'm just going to read it to you because it's too good for me to try to ad-lib it. 
She said, I was curled up in a fetal position on a filthy carpet in a cluttered apartment. I'm in horrible withdrawal from drug addiction. I have a little piece of paper. It's all dilapidated. I can hardly read it because I've been folding it and unfolding it, but I could still make out kind of the phone number on it. I'm in a state of bald terror. My husband is out, is trying to get a hold of some of the drugs that we needed, but right behind me, sleeping in the bedroom, is my baby boy. I knew I wasn't going to get any Mother of the Year award. In fact, at the age of 29, I was failing at a lot of things, so I decided to get clean. I was soon going to lose the most precious thing I'd ever have in my life, that baby boy. I was so desperate at the moment that I wanted to make use of that phone number. It was something my mother had sent me. She said, this is a Christian counselor. Maybe sometime you could call this person. It was two in the morning, but I punched in the numbers. I heard a man say hello, and I said, hi, I got this number from my mother. Uh, do you think you could maybe talk to me? He said, yes, yes, of course. What's going on? I told him I was scared and that my marriage had gotten pretty bad before long. I started telling him other truths like I was a drug addict. And this man just sat with me and listened and had such a kindness and a gentleness. Tell me more, he said. Oh, that must hurt very much. And he stayed up with me the whole night just being there until the sun rose. By then I was feeling calm. The raw panic had passed. I was feeling okay. I was very grateful to him. And so I said, I really appreciate you and what you've done for me tonight. How long have you been a Christian counselor? There was a long pause on the phone. He said, Auburn, please don't hang up. I'm afraid to tell you this. He paused again. You got the wrong number. I'm not a therapist but I've really enjoyed talking to you. She said, I didn't hang up on him. I never got his name. I never spoke to him again. But the next day, I felt like I was shining. I discovered that there was this completely random love in the universe, that it could be unconditional, and that some of it was for me. And it also became possible as a teetotaling single parent to raise up that precious baby boy into a magnificent young man, scholar, and athlete who graduated from Princeton in 2013 with honors. In the deepest, blackest night of despair, if you can get just one pinhole of light, all of grace rushes in. I want to write to her and say, there is love in the universe It's not random, but it is unconditional. It has a name, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. He's with us to give you faith, to accompany your fears, to give us hope, to steady us when fear gets the best of us and a perfect love, even when we dial wrong numbers, to know that he is with us always, even to the end of the age. Let's pray. God, thank you. Uh, help us not to be a king that got wrong like Herod, that we cave into the dark path through fear, through insecurity. But God, give us faith and hope and love. Let us know you are with us. And if you be for us, who can be against us? Which kingdom will we choose? Which king will we follow? That's the question of Christmas. I pray, dear Lord, that we choose you. In Jesus' name, let all God's people say, amen.